Hi everyone, it's Alexa at Nurses Notes 101. Today we're going to be talking about ECMO, so nursing care for ECMO. For many critical care nurses, ECMO is like the top tier. It does take a lot of monitoring, it takes diligence. Uh, yes, there are perfusionists who control the machines. We really don't touch them, but it's important to know issues that could happen and what's going on with your patient um, when things go wrong. So I'm going to go over ECMO. Um, ECMO stands for extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, usually seen um, post-cardiac surgery in cardiothoracic ICU units. Or it can be seen in MICU, someone in ARDS in the surgical ICU, someone in ARDS from, let's say, aggressive pancreatitis, uh, ARDS from pneumonitis. Um, but I've seen it most commonly in patients with cardiogenic shock, so more of a VA ECMO. But we also have VV ECMO, which I'm going to go through. So... ECMO is a system that uses an artificial membrane to circulate the patient's blood outside of the body. Disregard that it says water here. I meant to write body. So this system is kind of like dialysis, but instead of dialysis for the kidneys, what I like to tell family members is it's like dialysis for the lungs. The ECMO system performs the function of oxygenation by replacing carbon dioxide with oxygen in venous blood. So the ECMO oxygenator performs um, gas exchange. So just like it would in our lungs um, in the alveoli, if the alveoli are damaged or filled with fluid like an ARDS, um, ECMO is needed in more of a VV ECMO situation. So there's two types of ECMO, like I said. We have veno-arterial or veno-venous. Veno-arterial ECMO is for patients who have cardiogenic shock, circulatory failure, have issues with just their heart, um, and they have issues with their lungs as well. For VV ECMO, for veno-venous, this is for patients who just have issues with the lungs, no issues with their heart, they have a normal ejection fraction, they have no cardiogenic shock component, their heart is strong, but they have lung deterioration and respiratory failure from a source. The parts and function of the ECMO different components. To the left, I have a picture of what an ECMO circuit looks like. We have the display monitor, the blender or gas sweep, the pump console, the central fugal pump, the oxygenator, the gas exchanger, and the inlet and outlet venous circuits. To go through each of them, so the monitor, like any monitor, displays the numbers that we want to see. This is most of what we're writing down hourly in the patient's chart. So it displays patient's RPMs and liters of blood pumped per minute. The liters of blood pumped per, mi per minute is really important. That's what we're looking at um, most of the time to see if the ECMO is working accurately and helping the patient as much as they could. Um, a lot of times providers will give us a range of where they want their liters of blood to be um, per minute and we'll make sure that the setting is appropriate for the patient if we're seeing that they're going above or below, um, we can speak with the physicians and see if they'll talk with perfusion about changing uh, the RPMs of the machine around. The gas sweep uh, controls the amount of carbon dioxide that's removed from the body. So depending on what level the sweep is at, the higher the number it is at, um, the higher the carbon dioxide removal is. The pump console is situated at the foot of the bed facing the patient. This is another monitor just to look at the patient's values. Um, I think a lot of times that part has the silence button on it so we can silence the ECMO as well from there. I don't like touching the machine at all, but I know some nurses who feel comfortable just silencing an alarm if it's one that's common for the patient. I would rather call perfusion if something's going off. The central fugal pump 
is a rotating magnetic machine which creates a vortex. This vortex creates the power to drive blood through the circuit. So what is making this flow? So this that pump, that rotating magnet is what's driving the blood through the patient's body from this machine. So this is quintessential to this machine here. The oxygenator is also quintessential and very important to the machine. It is a large membrane um, which allows gas exchange to occur. Um, the rate of the oxygenator is usually set between 0 to 15 liters a minute. Uh, and this membrane is also very important to look at in reference to looking at fibrin and looking at clots. So what I usually do, I turn off the lights in my patient's room every hour. I get my pen light and I'll look in the edges of the oxygenator to see if there are any fibrin that like to form uh, or clots. So actually clots do appear most commonly on the edges and fibrin can appear inside of the oxygenator. So fibrin look like little white specks and clots are black. The heat exchanger is a component of the machine that warms the blood uh, of the patient as it passes through the oxygenator. A lot of times um, the patient is hypothermic just due to the circuit um, and this exchanger is common to be used to keep the patient warm um, and keep their blood warm. This machine also contains arterial and venous circuits. It consists of It consists of inflow and outflow cannulas. Um, the inflow cannula is the venous cannula and the outflow is the arterial cannula. Like previously said, um, there is VV versus VA ECMO. So in VA ECMO, they have obviously arterial cannulas. With VV ECMO, they only have venous cannulas. So it'll be a venous inflow and a venous outflow. Indications for ECMO. So there are different indications for VA versus VV, like I've said some before. Um, for venoarterial ECMO, one of the first indications is cardiogenic shock, circulatory failure, or failure to wean the patient from cardiopulmonary bypass machine after, let's say, a cabbage or a valve replacement. Um, some patients post cardiac arrest will be put on veno arterial ECMO to rest their heart. And then, like I said before, so VA ECMO is a condition that requires both cardiac and lung support. For VV ECMO, it is purely for lung support. Um, I've seen this also with patients who have cystic fibrosis. It's in patients who also have ARDS, respiratory failure from pneumonia, pneumonitis, and an indication and an indicator of the utilization of VV ECMO that I've seen are PF ratios under 100 when the patient's on an FiO2 greater than 90%. Contraindications for ECMO include significant aortic regurgitation, recent stroke, recent head trauma, unidentified sepsis, Severe, severe peripheral vascular disease or bleeding abnormalities. A lot of times, for instance, these patients are on heparin and due to platelet adhesions that can be caused by the machine, uh, the patient can have episodes of bleeding. So this would be a contraindication if the patient already has issues with bleeding. Uh, related to severe peripheral vascular disease, if the patient has history of DVTs or has very poor vascular and venous circulation, if we are going to cannulate them for the femoral artery, that is just going to be another issue for them and it can lead to them losing arterial flow to the extremity, which would be a big deal. Again, unidentified sepsis, if the patient has an unclear infection, we don't want to introduce any foreign body and give them another source of infection. Um, 
When a patient is on ECMO, they are at risk for clots. So any recent head trauma, recent strokes, it's just going to add to their risk of a neurological injury, like another stroke. Okay. So nursing concerns with ECMO. We want to focus our attention a thousand percent on the vital signs. So focus attention on heart rate, the heart rhythm, the blood pressure. A lot of times, most of the, most of the time, the patients will be using a Swan-Gans catheter or a pulmonary artery catheter. With the A-line, so with the arterial waveform, we also want to assess the pulsatility. Uh, we want to note if there's low pulsatility. So in a patient I've had uh, previously, the physicians kept on saying it looked like he was very low on his pulsatility. So he had a narrow pulse, plus, pulse pressure, and this showed worsening cardiac contractility and potentially an inadequate preload with right ventricular failure. So the patient I had, for instance, was post-cardiac arrest, uh, and the A-line honestly looked pretty flat. It didn't even look like there was a pressure there. Um, we couldn't get a manual pressure on him, but the A-line did have a little bit of a wave, but it was very dampened. And that's what they mean by low pulsatility. It means that pretty much if the ECMO machine wasn't there, the patient would have no blood pressure at all. Temperature, we also want to assess. Like I said previously, there's a heat regulator on the ECMO machine that we can use to prevent hypothermia. And then we want to assess if the patient um, is at risk of infection so obviously, if they're hyperthermic, there can be some sort of infectious source brewing, which could potentially be the cannulas. A lot of times, uh, the ECMOs are put in emergently, and if they aren't put in with the utmost sterility, infection can occur. We want to also assess oxygen saturations. These patients frequently have ABGs and mixed venous gases drawn from the swan catheter, um, I usually see them ordered at least every two hours. One of the things we also want to assess as nurses of a patient on ECMO is chattering. Uh, this is something that Perfusion always talks about. So chattering is when the inlet or venous cannulas become occluded. So this is usually due to hypovolemia. So the patient either needs fluid or there could be a clot in the circuit. The chattering, um, from what I've heard perfusion say, is the cannula is kind of like sucking on the vessel walls because there isn't much fluid there. So once you give the patient ample fluid, you'll hear or, you, or you'll actually see less chattering. You won't see the cannulas like move back and forth. And obviously this is a given. We want to make sure that we're always eyeballing the cannulas and eyeballing the patient. Every hour we're checking under the blankets if the patient has blankets on. Assess for cannula disconnection. If the patient disconnects from this, they are at high risk of exsanguinating. So one of the things that I was told to always have the bedside are two large clamps. So just in case that the patient was to get somehow disconnected, we are able to clamp that blood there so um, they're not exsanguinating out. Complications with ECMO. So there are a multitude of them, which I went over some of them before. Bleeding is number one, usually. So due to anticoagulation therapy, the patient's usually on platelet dysfunction and the ECMO circuit in general. So the ECMO circuit causes artificial or shearing stress, which can induce, like I said before, platelet, adhe platelet adhesion. Because there's going to be plat platelet adhesion to the ECMO circuit, there is less circulating platelets, which would cause bleeding in the patient. And the patient also um, will usually be on heparin. So this is going to cause further bleeding. In addition to that, a lot of these patients are usually anemic. Um, the ECMO circuit itself causes hemolysis from uh, the sheer stress of the circuit and due to high venous pressures, which is breaking red blood cells. Ec uh, ECMO can also cause neurological complications. Like I said, if there's a clot in the circuit, that can lead up to the brain, cause strokes, seizures, and intracranial hemorrhages, which can be caused by, again, platelet adhesions. <clears throat> Limb ischemia can be caused if the placement of a cannula in the femoral artery occludes the blood flow. And then infection can be caused just because it should be 
inserted sterilely, if the sterility is somehow mismanaged, um, this can happen. But the key to preventing infection with insertion of these cannulas is to give an antibiotic at the time of cannulation. All right, so let's say our patient's doing better. We're coming to a point where we're going to wean from the ECMO. So what we usually wean is the FiO2, so the percent oxygen the patient's getting via the ECMO, and the sweep, so the percentage of the gas exchange, the amount of carbon dioxide that's being removed. While we're, so we're going to wean these numbers while maintaining circuit flow. We're going to also closely monitor CO2 removal, oxygen levels, and hemodynamic stability. Like I said before, during weaning as well, we're going to do frequent ABGs, mixed gases, and also take cardiac indexes and outputs to make sure that all the patient's numbers are within normal. Let's say their cardiac index drops to 2, 1.5, or there is an increase in vasopressor requirements. This is an indication of a patient's failure to wean, so they would have to go back on the ECMO support they are on previously. <clears throat> a lot of times with weaning as well, with what I have seen, an echocardiogram can be used to evaluate in real time how the heart looks and how it's contracting during the weaning process. If the patient is deemed capable of decannulating, the decannulation will happen in the OR by the cardiothoracic surgeon. And last but not least, not what you want to see for your patient, but this can happen, so a cardiac arrest on an ECMO machine. Cardiac arrest on ECMO is defined by a loss of a native cardiac output on ECMO. So the ECMO machine is keeping the person alive, especially if they're on VA ECMO. Um, but cardiac arrest with an ECMO is a loss of the person's native cardiac output. Co common rhythms for a person in cardiac arrest on ECMO is V-fib or asystole. It could also be... Um, ventricular standstill too. So there is a difference in cardiac arrest for patients with VA versus VV ECMO. On VA ECMO, the circuit will maintain organ perfusion in cardiac arrest. So it's actually not necessary to do compressions. I repeat, in VA ECMO, it is not necessary to do compressions because the ECMO is doing the work of that for us. However, let's say the flows in the circuit are low, there's pump failure, something's going on with the machine when the patient's arresting, then CPR should be performed and ACLS should be followed. On the contrary, in VV ECMO, this ECMO is only provided to patients who have a good and functioning heart. It's, depending on, it's dependent on the native cardiac function, like I just said. So with these patients, we always want to do CPR. The, this machine is not doing the work of the heart. It's only doing the work of the lungs. So we still want to do CPR if they code. Point blank. <laughs> um, with these patients, just an FYI, thrombus is a common occurrence into why patients actually go into cardiac standstill. All right. That's it for ECMO. I hope uh, this little brief on it helped. I hope this helped your next exam. I hope this helps you further as a critical care nurse to feel more comfortable with ECMO. I know when I first did ECMO, it's definitely a little bit scary. Um, it is a, it's a pretty intimidating machine. There's a lot to know about it, but uh, it's important. And uh, thank you for watching Nurses Notes 101. Please hit the like button and subscribe to my channel. Thank you.